Okay, two people can hear me. That's a good start. Um, yes, thank you so much for coming tonight, everybody. I am super excited that you're all here. My name is Scott Murray. I teach in the design program here at USF, and I help organize this data visualization speaker series in conjunction with my colleagues, uh, Sophie, Sophie Engel and Alaric Joshi, who are both here from the computer science department. And this is our second event in the fall speaker series, and we are really thrilled to have a big mix of like professionals, local practitioners, and students working or um, participating here tonight. So I hope you'll take the opportunity to, um, you know, meet each other and mingle and sort of uh, get to know each other. First of all, obviously, we are thrilled that Andy Kirk has agreed to come talk here tonight. He was going to be in town just for a couple days anyway for doing one of his trainings, and we were able to um, convince him to come talk to all of us tonight. So we are thrilled he's traveled here all the way from the UK just for us, and uh, we don't usually get to see him in person. As a bonus, Santiago Ortiz uh, also happens to be visiting from Argentina, and so we are squeezing him into the schedule. Um, both of these people are just fantastic, brilliant speakers and do amazing work. So we're thrilled, really excited to have them here tonight. <laughs> Jerome agrees. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask um, one quick thing is if you could save your questions until the end, just because we're trying to fit two talks into the time span of one talk. And at the end, we're actually um, going to have Q&A for both of the speakers up in the front, and I'll, I'll field the questions at the end. Now for the part that is boring to you, but really essential to me, these events actually take a lot of coordination to put together. So I really want to thank, first of all, the Office of the Dean and the College of Arts and Sciences. They provide the funding for these events. They help manage uh, tons of logistics just to get everybody here and get the food set up and the drinks in the room and all that stuff. Um, so especially Chris Brooks, Associate Dean, and Lisa Loxon, who works in the dean's office, helped us coordinate tons of stuff here tonight. Uh, Rosa Maria Gray in the computer science department was a huge help, and Sha Wang, who can't be here tonight, but is one of the founding organizers of the Bay Area Data Viz group, helps us promote this through the meetup group, and so we're really thankful to all of them. Finally, the students who've been really instrumental in tonight's event, uh, the promotional images and posters, not this, but the one you saw just a second ago, uh, it was designed by Andy Davies, who's sitting back there in the green shirt. So uh, if you like his work, you know, give him a job or something. And uh, let's see. Oh, we had some volunteers from computer science. Kayla, Leo, and Mohammed. thank you so much for helping check people in at the door. That's a big help. Uh, Sophie and Alark, obviously we couldn't do this without them. And tonight, Gesundheit, Santiago, and Andy. So Santiago, please, let's start us off. Good night. Thank you very much uh, to Scott and everyone here. Uh, this comes as a surprise as well for me. I didn't know that the meetup will coincide with my visit, so I wrote to Scott and he very gently uh, invited me to give a very uh, short talk before the great uh, Andy Kirk. So I'm very happy and honored to talk before, before you. Okay, so it's gonna be fast. Um, what I am going to talk this night is about the synergies between data science and data visualization. Different thing, different ways these two areas of knowledge and practice can be combined, okay? And that means data science applied to data visualization, data visualization applied to data science, so both directions. <laughs> You go, okay, <laughs> etc. I think I'm gonna have to change resolution. Sorry. Okay, now it works perfectly. So this is a project. Um, it's an experimental project I am creating uh, for the Economist. Uh, the idea is to try to address the problem of uh, representing numbers or interacting with numbers in different ways. In this case, the exploration goes towards patterns more than quantities. So you have S&P 500 companies, 
Uh, this is a scatter plot with earnings in the x axis and tax in the y axis. Tax paid over those earnings. And this is a, an exponential axis. So it grows very, very fast. Okay? 500 companies here. So if I click on Apple here, I have this particular story of this particular company. This is one to four years. So you see this is a connected scatter plot. Colors help also to, to understand the direction, right? Now, you can compare uh, different companies. And what, what one didn't uh, realize immediately is that there are different stories over there. Companies that tend to grow in terms of earnings and pay more taxes uh, in all sorts of direction and even sort of going back and forth, okay? If I expand the time period, I will see even more complex patterns. So how to find interesting stories here? So for the started, let's go back to Apple. Um, the first question one might ask is, okay, which other companies have a similar pattern behavior uh, to a certain company? So if I click on Apple, I will find other companies that be behave similar, okay? If I click here in 3M, uh, companies similar to 3M, etc. So I can navigate this space of uh, correlations. It's, it's, it's pattern recognition based on correlation, on b-dimensional correlation. Then one can ask, one can try to think on a particular pattern and try to try to find companies that follow that pattern. That will be doing something like this. I draw my pattern and the algorithm will find the companies that better match that pattern. With a lower number of years, it will work better, I think. Okay, so different companies. These are companies, for instance, that are doing very well, earning more and more, paying less and less taxes. <laughs> This is the opposite case, okay? This is the sad stories. <laughs> okay, so this is a little bit trying to match or to uh, approximate kind of more sophisticated analysis with interaction and data visualization. <coughs> this is the small multiple view, which is probably more interesting with taking into account the 11 years, so all sorts of different behaviors, and then cluster analysis that will try to find uh, pockets or groups of, uh, of companies that behave similar. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to introduce a platform using my company. So I am the head of Mo Moevio, or Moevio in English. Uh, <laughs> we are a small team uh, working for clients but doing a lot of research. And we use this platform to build our projects, the one I will show you right now. And this is a platform for data visualization and, and data analysis, data science combined, okay? Okay, so this is it. This is the, the platform, like, so let's build something here. The first thing I will do is to create something. In this case, a network. So this is a menu of options, of modules. So create network or create random network. Okay? So I bring a module that is called create random network. And that has two values to uh, inlets, two values I have to, to use to fit the module. The number of nodes and the probability any two nodes will be connected. So let's say 500 and a very low probability because if not, the number of possible connections is too big. So the probability should be kept very low in order to create a more or less balanced network such as this one. So I already produced a network. So what can I do? I can analyze this network and many other things. Of course, I can visualize the network. So this, 
one of the most important components here in this platform is this external box that you can feed with a URL. And it basically loads a website. But if it happens that this website follows certain very simple protocol, and let's say this website is actually a visualization project for the web, and it follow, it has basically two functions to receive and send data, very simple. Uh, it can actually use to, uh, to be fed by data coming from this space. So in this case, I won't type a external URL. I, I'm gonna use a model that is already in, in my server. So I just have to type the name of the, of the network. But it could be a model in an external server. So this is how we use this, this platform. Developers in different places building blocks or modules, placing them first in their servers. We connect with them and we create more complex projects by combining different uh, modules. So I connect the network and we have a visualization of a network. I'm gonna change here the, the visualization mode of the network. This use a forces algorithm, okay? So now it's driven by forces and another interesting thing is that you can code on top of the platform because there is a module called GS box. So you can introduce your own code here, okay? So this is very good for, for fast prototyping. So it's not the first time I, I do this. So this, the, the module that I'm building here, it receives a network. It goes throughout all its nodes, okay? And it maps a function on those nodes. So this node, and what I'm gonna do is assign a color for each node. And in order to do that, I'm gonna go to color scales select one particular color scale, and this is a function that receives a number between zero and one. What I'm gonna do is tri uh, a little trick here. I'm gonna count the number of relations each node has and divide by 10. Not all numbers will be in between zero and one, but I know it will work, okay? So that will assign if it works, colors to, to the nodes. Okay, so this is the platform. This is how it works. But the interesting thing happens when, when we combine different visualization modules with interactive modules, etc. So I'm gonna show you a, a couple of examples. So uh, this, this case, I'm gonna show you how to use in an interactive way predictive models that can be also tested by interaction, okay? This is an interesting exercise. Uh, the idea is that normally uh, machine learning algorithms, su such as this one, uh, are trained to identify categories, to classify, right? So what they do usually is to find a frontier here that will define from which set each point in the plane belongs, more or less. But what, what I did here is an experiment in which I can actually draw my own frontier. So I draw a, a polygon and I test it, okay? And this, I, I have here the, the feedback about the, the, the false positive, the true positive, false negative, and true negative, okay? So, and I have actually the measure the accuracy of this model, which is not bad at all compared against uh, algorithms such as uh, K uh, nearest neighbors, okay? It's not bad. I, we did some experiments comparing humans versus machine learning algorithms, and this via seems very promising, especially when you make uh, ensembles. You combine humans with machines, and if you combine in a good way, the, the accuracy of the, of the meta model is much better than just one single model. So 
Here is a, it's just an example of how to play with both things at the same time. Visualization, actually three things, visualization, interaction, and data science. Okay, let's go now to a real <coughs> client project. This is Skoda, it's a car manufacturer in, in Czech Republic, and the, what I will show you is the, the board we use to build all the different views that we deliver to the client. Um, it's based on a survey, on a big survey, uh, hundreds of thousands of people being surveyed about the, the, the cars they just bought. So this is ages, so what I do is to filter following different criteria, filtering these filter people. So in this case, ages from a range of ages, this is the ages distribution. These are the different uh, makers. So for instance, Peugeot. These are countries, I'm gonna select Germany. So for each selection, for each filtering, each the visualization will adapt. So this, this is the map for Germany. Let's pick one particular brand here, Toyota. And you see there is like a, an ecosystem of different modules that interact and share information and also are connected throughout interaction because different modules are interactive and help filter and change the, the information that flows throughout the, the connections. So let me select a couple of different makers, Toyota and Fiat. I, I am uh, identifying this population and compare them. I put on a stack this selection and, and I can make different comparison analysis, etc. So it's very wide. But one interesting feature is that, of course, we don't deliver this to the client. But we have the components, the elements that can be integrated. So I created this sort of a layout script that basically defines or builds a composition, a layout, using uh, IDs from the modules. So this will hopefully build a composition. So this is more close of what we deliver to clients. So now data is loading. And you have here basically what I mentioned, right? So a more clean view of the, mod the, of the interactive and visualization models, okay? And finally, the last example I want to show you, it's much more uh, closer to, to data science because it's actually a data visualization based on, on a prediction uh, method called decision tree. So the idea here is not using visualization to produce a better prediction, but use a prediction algorithm to produce, to generate a better visualization. That is a system that helps people better understand data. So from this tool, you can imagine there are so many ways to filter data by combining different things such as population, a country, uh, from, from the makers you can select by maker, by family, by model, it's too complex. There are, there are also categories for types of churn so you can filter by churn as well. So one can make a lot of questions about, for instance, where are uh, the most extreme churners in this multidimensional space? So for that purpose, the, there are uh, several machine learning algorithms that do that. They try to find the most extreme cases. So these are the cases in which probabilities are always in the extreme. So you can bet on those, on those cases. You can predict. We're gonna see here is a prediction algorithm called decision trees, visualize and navigable. And these are all the things that can be predicted. So basically all the features and some compound features from the database, from the table can be predicted. For instance, let's predict a female. So if we want to know 
if the person that bought the car is male or female. What we want to try to understand is first which are the main features to predict gender and how they are organized. So that's exactly what this decision tree does. It organizes the entire spa multidimensional space and the, the first thing it says is that prices are the most important feature when it comes to predict gender. So you see red is more males, white and especially blue is more female. So let's see an extreme case here. So very cheap cars in France are basically bought by women, okay? <laughs> so that's, that's exactly the, what this uh, algorithm does. It finds the, 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 the extreme cases, so in, in both sides. So these are the cases in which you can predict. So knowing all features except gender, you can predict gender in those cases. So uh, going back to the, to the big three, here you have the entire spectrum, and here you have all the things. So what brings interactivity, this is also what is called a supervised analysis. You choose the variable, and then you put all the analytics, uh, all your methodologies and tools to try to predict that particular variable. But Interaction and visualization allows to play with different features, compare feature is much faster, is more uh, intuitive, and gives a lot, of course, a lot of insight to understand your data. So that's it. Thank you very much. Later, yeah. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me at the back and at the front, of course. Um, my name's Andy Kirk. I'm British. Um, where I come from, it is now 3.25 a.m., so, as I've said to a few people, what follows is none of my fault whatsoever. So, let's see how we get through this next 30 minutes or so, anyway. And one quick pro tip, never follow Santiago, because that's just, <laughs> that, that, that's, just, uh, that's just too good. Anyway, um, when I was thinking about this title and I was getting pressure from Scott, where's the title and the abstract from this talk? We need a title. Um, and I kind of threw one together and I put it out there. And I, on the flight over on, um, on Tuesday, I was thinking, this is such a bad title. It's really, really bad. Um, and it kind of felt like the sort of title that you'd see someone like Troy McClure put together on an on a inform information um, package on, on The Simpsons. Um, and then I, I was kind of thinking how bad this title is. And I, was, I saw someone on the plane doing a slide deck in front of me. And it, it was really bad. And I thought... Well, it might be a bit of fun to try and do the very worst opening slide. And <laughs> so, okay, kind of, you know, we've got, we've got all the ingredients of bad. We've got comic songs, and we've got the, the road, the journey, and we've got a, th a, a thinking lady. But anyway, the point is, I, I kind of uh, was a bit kind of reluctant to, to keep the title, but I, I, I stayed with it. And I think it's probably, it gets across what I'm going to try and cover in this next 25 minutes. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, if you you may not know who, who the hell I am, actually. Um, I guess I'm a data visualization specialist. I would never say expert, because uh, you just set yourself up for a big fall. Um, I'm a specialist. I guess I dominate most of my work in doing training courses and teaching on a postgraduate course at MICA in Baltimore. I also do research at the University of Leeds. I do design consultancy, design work. but. Really, the, the heart of what I'm trying to achieve in my work, especially on the teaching and the writing side, is to try and kind of keep this gap 
between the very best, the very top end of the field, and the everyday person. And to not let this sense of a rubber band get stretched too far. As the new theories and the new techniques and the new talent comes into the field, pushing the boundaries, developing new ideas and new concepts, we need to keep the rest of the world, the everyday person, it's a horrible term, but the everyday person, we need to keep them in touching distance of this field. And so, of course, to try and find a way to bridge this gap, you, of course, need talent. You need the talent, the, the design flair, the computer science skills, the data fluency, the type of skills that Santiago has just shown. And many people in the room today, people like Wes and Jerome and Scott and Kim Reese and Mike Bosick, all these top names, they've got the, the raw talent. But you've also got this other side of the equation, which is much more attainable in my mind, which is better thinking, better quality thinking about the work that you're involved in and the challenges you're facing. And what I want to kind of go through for this next period of time is to run through five basic attributes that I believe are very important about good visualization thinking. Now, the first of these is about organized thinking. It's about the sequence of your thinking. It's about process. And I, I among, as, as many of you do out there, I have my own process that I, I teach and discuss in my, in my workshops and my books. Um, I'm not going to go into the details today. That's not for today. But we all have this process that in theory is presented as a, as a very kind of linear process. But the reality, of course, is there's all sorts of iterations and forward and backwards motion. It's a very cyclical process. But it's something that tries to harmonize both practical thinking and creative thinking. And what we're all trying to do in the visualization field is try and find a process that works for us, that tries to help us organize our thinking. And just to give a little uh, hat tip to Scott as well, one of the talks that Scott gave at the Graphical Web in the UK in August, I think it was, yeah. Um, great discussion about some work that Scott's been doing to gather evidence of different people's processes and what we can learn about the kind of harmonized view of this. So I would strongly recommend watching both the video, but also looking at the uh, details that Scott shares on the, on the talk there. But the key thing about this idea of process is it's a framework for thinking, but it's not about procedure. Because procedure is insert item A into slot B and follow these very precise rules and procedures, and you'll end up with the same thing every single time. You'll end up with a bar chart. Amanda Cox, there says there's a strand of the data of his world that argues everything could be a bar chart, which is possibly true, but also a world without joy. <laughs> so she's recognizing, as we all do, that there's a time and place for the bar chart. But if we follow just the rules and just the hardcore principles, we will never move beyond that same product every time. We need to have flexibility in our thinking, the ability to respond to the different variables that we are faced with in any different project. It's about knowing where to begin. It's about knowing what pathway to take. We are never really faced with any project that doesn't have some time-bound constraints. We can't afford to be pursuing endless blind alleys. We need to have some sense of a direction of travel as early as possible, but also embrace experimentation. We also need to kind of organize the thinking in terms of the flow and the cohesion of thinking. We know at some point we're going to have to face the prospect of color choices and typography and interactive features, potentially. But there's a time and place for that thinking. We drop them into the blue drawers for now, we close those drawers, and we think about other things first that will help inform those choices. So the essence of organized thinking is to come up with the most effective and efficient way to sequence your thinking in visualization design. The second key attribute of thinking is context, contextual thinking framing our thinking. And this is indeed the most boring aspect of visualization. Context, for those of you who are ever faced with the question of what's the best visualization, it depends. It's such a boring thing that you have to trot out every single time, but it's true. And one of the things that's very important about being a, a practitioner and a follower and an observer and a consumer of visualization is to look beyond the surface of the projects that you're consuming and you're looking at and try and be more sympathetic or empathetic to what goes on behind the scenes. We're not there. We're not faced with the problems and the challenges and the factors and the constraints that people are having to kind of overcome. 
We don't see behind the scenes. But context is such an important attribute of any visualization project. Now, here's a little, um, I'd say, kind of borderline dumb exercise, but we'll, we'll go with it for now. The, this is a, a, a little thing that was in a, a book by Bill Buxton. And it's something that actually, I'll give a hat tip to uh, Mark Daggett, who I uh, saw present this a few years ago. But bear with me on this. Imagine you are kayaking along the coast of Greenland and you need a chart to navigate. There are three options. Which is the best? Now, we'll probably all know what the answer is, but let's just stick with it. We've got kind of a sat nav device there. We've got a mapping, a uh, printed map there. And we've got this rather curious wooden Inuit map thing at the end. So if you think about the different factors that you might be faced with, it needs to cope with being wet. Well, in this case, that wouldn't work very well, and that wouldn't work very well. The wood map for now wins this round. It needs to float if we drop it in the water. Oh, look, the wood map's winning. It needs to work in the dark. Well, this one now gets little points on the scores, but the map is still not going to work very well for us. It needs to work without cellular signal. It shouldn't be cumbersome to use. We can't rely on anything that needs power. It's too cold to work without gloves. You can see where this is going, of course. The final score is two, two, and six wins out because in the given context it was faced with it is the best solution in the initial understanding of the options that we've got you would never pick that rudimentary piece of wood and that's why context is such an important attribute and this was something as I mentioned that was in the book by Bill Buxton and it's a really great example of contextual thinking and he talks about in this in this in this kind of passage in the in the, in the book this example reinforces my thesis that in order to design a tool, we must make our best efforts to understand the larger social and physical context within which it's intended to function. And so this key attribute of context, what's the best visualization solution? It will always depend. And it's up to you as designers to gather all the evidence, all the environmental scanning that will inform those best choices. The third attribute, of good visualization thinking is imaginative thinking, harnessing and embracing our instincts. Our instincts offer a unique perspective on life. Um, this was something that was in the Atlantic about a year ago, no, at the start of this year. And they invited, invited 30 people, I think it was, to draw the earth, to draw the, the countries of the earth. And these are just three examples of Like more of a coffee stain, and that, that was the that was the the kind of amalgamation of all thirty uh, suggestions. We've all got a unique perspective on life. We've all got unique insights and understandings about the world around us. Um, I think, from memory, I might be wrong, but I think this is a a drawing of the U.S. by Sean Carter of the New York Times, and you can see where he's based. Um, but we apply our our biases and experiences to the world around us. This is something from uh, Google Creative Labs. I think Aaron Koblin uh, ran this project. And this was a, uh, an invitation for people to draw a car. That was the brief. Draw a car with two wheels pointing in that direction. I think it was 50,000 cars later, they kind of stitched together this sequence of cars, this kind of parade of cars. Everyone is different. Every car is unique. Even though we were all given the same task, Every car is different because our perception in our mind's eye about what a car looks like is, of course, very different from the next person. And when you see things like visualization contests and you see the submissions, even though everyone's been given the same data, the same constraints, and the same brief, such different interpretations of what the best solution may be. And so this idea of embracing our instincts, we shouldn't eliminate that. And that's why I, I try and avoid things like rules and procedure. We need to embrace these natural instincts. Embrace the power of sketching. Such an easy, free option for us to sketch out, get those ideas out of the brain and onto paper, especially when you collaborate with others. Such an easy way to kind of embrace these instinctive ideas. We can draw influence and inspiration from elsewhere. 
Uh, this is a, an iPhone game called Mon Monument B Valley, which I was playing a while back, and the colours were beautiful and so elegant that when I came to do a project um, around the same time, I felt some of these colours might inform my palette. In the end, I didn't actually use them. But being inspired by what we see and consume around us is such a free and easy way to kind of start some design thinking. Of course, there's a, there's a fine line, and one of the controversies, as it gets in visualization, I guess, is this idea of plagiarism slash influence slash copying. I mean, when we do a bar chart, we don't need to thank William Playfair every single time we do a bar chart. But if you do something based on something like Moritz's Better Life Index, should we still attribute some credits for that? Should we still be inspired and be allowed to, to kind of riff on these different solutions? I mean, there have been plenty of examples in recent times of blatant copying, things like some of these interesting graphics that have been discovered, purely copied from others. But we should be inspired by this golden age of visualization, this era that we li now live in, people experimenting and trying out new things. We should be inspired by these. And one of the things I try and do whenever I start a project is sketch out instinctive ideas that come to mind. And I'm going to pick on the front row. I think we'll pick on, let's, let's pick on this group of five people in the front row. Uh, if you were faced with the task of working on a graphic or a visualization to do with the analysis about the impact of psychotherapy treatment on patients in Alaska 2013, what key words come to mind? Cold. Cold. Sorry. Dark. Madness. <laughs> Let's go second row. Seraphine, <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. Let's let's let, well, let's cross that off actually. Crazy. Okay, yeah. We'll have that. Third row. Depression. Depression. Yeah. Diagnosis. Diagnosis. These were kind of the keywords. This was a project I worked on this summer. These are the keywords that came to my mind. It's about care. It's about health. <coughs> It's about deterioration, health, unhealth. It's about having integrity and being authoritative and being sensitive as well. It may be that you never use these words, but just as a form of reference, they may inspire some sense of your thinking about the tone of voice and the things to kind of care about. But also the mental images that come to mind. So when I was thinking about this, I kind of think about the cold, I think about Alaska and the Arctic. This was a colour palette that I found on a design site. I know now that penguins don't exist in the Arctic. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my site, that's their site. But this, this colour palette was something I eventually used and it felt consistent with the, the look and feel I was looking towards. But I also wanted to avoid the blues, the blackness of, of a really dark kind of style. So, this kind of instinctive initial starting point is something we can embrace. We might not use it, but it's very free. It's a very available set of thinking to apply. Because those cliches, those responses that you've just over there, might be the responses that your audience are expecting or anticipating. Front row, on this side. A graphic to mark the milestone of the 500th execution in Texas. What words, what imagery, what colours form in your mind? Mistakes. Mistakes. <laughs> Innocence. Right. Innocence. Any others? Sorry? Electrical. Electrical chair, yeah. Any colours? The green of the gas. The green of the gas? Oh, wow. <coughs> an even more scary place than I thought. <laughs> Some kind of mental image that formed in my mind was uh, the orange of the prison uniforms. The kind of sepia tone of a Vintage Alcatraz picture. These are ideas that you can't switch off. These are the responses, instinctive responses you can't switch off. So embrace them. You might not use it. You might not use it to guide your thinking. But it's free, so accept it and harness it. So this idea of imaginative thinking is about taking those mental visualizations, those instinctive keywords and imagery, and keeping a note of them. What you think about the task, the topic, and its data. <coughs> the fourth attribute is this kind of journalistic sensibility. The ability to harness curiosity. To my mind, a natural inherent quality of curiosity is probably the most important attribute of a good visualization designer. 
the ability or the interest to kind of pursue something that you're curious about, to try and find a, a solution to a problem. Uh, this was one of the many projects last year that you may have seen that looked at the age of buildings in cities. Just something that kind of initially triggered by someone's curiosity. They were able to access some data and then create a portrayal. The work by Periscopic. In the aftermath of the, um, the, the Sandy Hook disaster, the, the motive that they had to, to try and find a way to visualize and bring to people's attention this huge story about gun crimes across the US. That was the motive that drove them to find this, this portrayal. But going further than just doing a visualization, going that extra length to actually tell a story, to tell and portray the insight that they discovered from this work. And that idea of kind of a journalist, analyst sensibility to not just find stories, but to also show them, to share them with people. And just to drop in one name, one of the people I think is one of the most talented data journalists that I've had, um, has been on my radar this year, Christopher Abraham at the Washington Post, does some wonderfully prolific, curiosity-based data journalism. And they, I think he's one of the very best in the field right now. He really kind of demonstrates this, this importance of embracing your curiosity. And the other aspect about this is this journalistic sensibility. The idea that visualization is also almost a form of photojournalism. As Boris articulates in this wonderful article he wrote about the middle of this year. And it's about this idea of thinking about visualization as almost a form of photojournalism. The idea of a photograph that we take, we frame, we zoom in, we zoom out, we exclude, we include things. The famous photograph of Times Square, the story's there. We can exclude almost all that other imagery because that's where the heart of the story exists. That very famous snapshot of that scene. Um, I know there's probably only a small handful of soccer fans in the room, but this is a very famous photograph of Diego Maradona at the time, the very best player in the world. And the idea of this photograph was, he's so good that they need six defenders. <laughs> they only need six defenders to stop him. And it's been a famous photograph all these years. Until recently, someone said, hang on a minute, I've watched that game. And he was stood next to the wall for a free kick. It was passed to him, and then they were all naturally already collected. <laughs> <laughs> so, part of this, Jersey sensibility is to, is to get a representative angle. And it's also about getting all the relevant angles. This is probably the most famous uh, selfie of all time. What I love about this is the other angle, which shows Liza Minnelli. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, to, to get. So, in a sense, it's about looking at your data from all angles possible and teasing out all the interesting insights. It's about having the curiosity as a consumer of visualization, to spot the exceptions, to sniff out the stories, to look at graphics and challenge the, the exceptions. This is the project from uh, Bloomberg Visual Team. And you've got all these billionaires ranked every day and updates every day. What I find most interesting are those that don't have illustrated faces. These are the people that are so kind of reclusive and elusive. We don't even know what they look like. This is a wonderful project from just this last weekend from um, Gregor and Kevin at the, at the Young Shop. I don't know much about NFL, all it pretends to, but there's some stories I can see as an analyst here about the trajectory of, of careers, the rapid risers, the points of injury, the points where a career kind of tailed off towards the end, the uh, sunny valve, the, sort of the duration of someone's career, kind of 30, 40 years. There's all sorts that you can find in one single static display, even if you don't know the subject. So this idea of journalistic thinking is about recognising what triggers your data focused curiosity and thinking about what photographs of your data do you need to convey the message that you're trying to get across. The last of these five attributes is critical thinking. It's really developing the craft, developing your skills as a craftsperson. The first part of this is being independent, being a kind of an independent critical <coughs> mindset. Um, this was a 3D sort of area chart thing that was on, um, we're doing the rounds on Twitter a few weeks ago. 
And Robert Cazara wrote a really interesting piece about this. And he was actually praising it. He actually felt it worked quite well. And I think this is a great quote. It's quite long, but I won't read it out. But the idea that we, we shouldn't just have this kind of knee-jerk reaction. We should just follow, the, follow the, the crowd. Have our own independent thoughts about what works for us and what doesn't work for us and why. As he says, just because something in 3D, just because it's a pie chart, doesn't mean to say it's always bad. Usually it will be. But there are those exceptions where we need to be able and confident to stand out from the noise. And critical thinking is about the breadth of thinking, the recognition of all these choices that we're faced with. 136 different chart types in 34 seconds, if I remember rightly. It just shows you the array of options that we've got and many, many more besides. We need to have this awareness to fully equip ourselves with the, the breadth of visual vocabulary that we need to fully express what it is we want to say in data. It's also about the depth of thinking. Um, back in April, I was up at um, the OpenVis conference and gave a talk about the, the design of nothing. And this was something that I've I found such a fascinating slice, a very niche slice of the visualization field. How you give life and give meaning to zeros and nulls and blanks. How you utilize these kind of elusive, invisible properties. It's just one slice of the game, but there's so much to it, there's so much depth to it. So many different options that we can use to show and represent zeros. And so developing our critical thinking is not just the breadth of choices, but the depth and the detail with which we dive into our array of options. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Dieter Rams and his very relevant 10 principles of good design. Uh, and he's just one of the many designers who touches their face. <laughs> <laughs> and there is, a, there is a Tumblr for that, by the way. Um, yeah. but the, and there's quite a few. Do you remember? Uh, but one of the key principles that I think really kind of resonates with me most is this idea of good design is thorough down to the last detail. Nothing must be arbitrary or left to chance. We should be able to challenge our thinking about every choice that we make. And we should be able to think and care about every single pixel that we have in our displays. And to try and drive on this issue, just to kind of finish off my talk, I'm going to need six volunteers. I need three males and three females. I'm going to have a battle of the sexes. And what I'm going to challenge you to do is to look at a graphic and spend three minutes sketching out all the design choices that you can imagine went into that piece of work. And I've brought all the way up from the UK, and it's very heavy, some prizes. The best American infographics book of 2014. This will go to the winning team. So I'll put those there for now. So I'd like to have three volunteer females, please. Two males, but there. Thumbs down, so one there. Two more, two more volunteers. One there, yeah, one more. Good for you. That's round of applause for the little list. So that's, that's your podium there. And then three men. Jerome. Up there, yeah, and then you so sort of that. Thank you very much. Round of applause for this team.
donkey. Oh, man. That's all right. But the things that you can see that feasibly been incorporated into the work. So I'm going to start the clock now. So you've got three minutes. Sketch as many as possible. You and the audience can answer some thinking if you wish, or just talk amongst yourselves. So the three minutes starts now.
things that's yeah. going on the water bodies, which kind of influence wind. Okay, I'm welcome to this one. Thank you. Uh, Good info. Yeah, sure. You've got the tool tips and their contents and their font. Yeah. You know, the, the URL at the bottom. Uh, you, one thing that's missing is, is clearly the color of the blue boundaries, uh, bodies of water. Yeah. Uh, you're missing any ability to export the data. You're missing any ability to press the share button yeah. and send it out to your tweets. Thank you. And then last two off big you. Thank you very much.